Hyatt again with another short lecture for my oceanography class 328-528. Today I have a short segment on the physical attributes of ocean spreading and some of the implications for the plate tectonic theory again. It's another really interesting topic. So we're in this section of ocean basins of plate tectonics and we've been focusing on the basins themselves and this is still in the series of early beliefs and discoveries. All these different pieces of the puzzle that go into building the plate tectonic theory. And today I want to focus on mid-ocean ridges. So this is K in our series of notes. And the thing that we have to focus on now, the complexities of spreading a solid crust on a spherical, roughly spherical, surface of the Earth. Mid-ocean ridge in the Atlantic, we mentioned that and talked about that before. This is Marie Tharp's characterization of the Atlantic Ocean Basin with the axial valley shown in red here on the map. The thing that we didn't talk about but seems glaringly obvious at this point are all of the structures that offset the ridge. So sometimes the ridge takes kind of a zigzag pattern by these transverse large fault systems that cut the mid-ocean ridge. So we need to address why that is and why the ridge looks the way it does. We, we talked about spreading, and we often think about spreading like this in a flat map view. So if you think back, this was the approximate ages of the Earth plotted in map view and kind of extrapolated for different regions on the ocean floor with the youngest being on the mid-ocean ridge and then the older parts of the seafloor, the ocean crust, away from the ridge. Spreading at the mid-ocean ridges on a flat surface like this map view is not that big a deal. So the spreading could just occur away from the spreading centers, from the axial valleys, and the spreading would just occur laterally, horizontally, at the same rate. But on the spherical Earth, that's a problem. Movement of the lithosphere or the surface layer of the Earth on a sphere is really complex. This cartoon shows a spherical Earth with three plates, plate A, B, and C. And when we move plate A, something interesting happens. You get some kind of weird shapes occurring as you move along and separate and overlap the plates. And if, if we flatten this out onto a map view, we'd get kind of a trapezoidal shape of these, of these cuts, of these overlaps. This shows some interesting aspects, the sliding past each other. In basic plate tectonics, you might have learned about that. It's called a transform boundary, a transform fault, transforming side to side. And where the plates come together, we get a convergent plate boundary because the plates are converging. And then where they're spreading and space being created, that's a divergent plate boundary. And that's the mid-ocean ridges. The mid-ocean ridges are divergent plate boundaries. We can have divergence on the continents too, and we saw that in the East African rift system. Movement of the solid surface on a sphere is complex because the Earth is, well, a sphere. And you see that complexity with these horizontal faults cutting the mid-ocean ridge in the Atlantic. And if we zoom in a little bit, you see even more cutting the mid-ocean ridge and in some places offsetting the ridge. So we have to look at why that is. Some of these other lines, these that are kind of trending northwest, southeast, are artifacts of the sonar data when the seafloor topography was actually collected. I've highlighted some of the major offsets in the mid-ocean ridge, some of the faults cutting the mid-ocean ridge, and you see it's almost perpendicular. Often it's exactly perpendicular to the spreading direction. These are called transform faults, and transform faults offset the mid-ocean ridge, but they're accommodating spreading on this spherical shape. It's not exactly a sphere. The Earth is actually kind of a flattened spheroid. So due to the rotation of the Earth, it's actually the radius from the center of the Earth to the equator is longer than the radius from the center of the Earth to the poles, to the North Pole and to the South Pole. So it's a little bit squashed. It's like a basketball with 
some pressure put on it, like you put some weight on a basketball. These faults that cut and sometimes offset the mid-ocean ridges are called transform faults. The reason we have them is that the spreading is occurring on a sphere. If we spread the solid surface of a sphere, we have one or of two options. We can either change the rate of spreading, more close, more spreading, a faster rate near the equator, and slower near the poles because there's less distance to go, or we can change the shape. We can keep the rate the same along the spreading center. We would have to change and distort the shape of the solid surface. So the two options, if the shape stays the same, the rate must change along the spreading from pole to equator, or if the rate stays the same, we have to change the shape. Transform faults allow the rate to change as we move with latitude. The Earth's surface is solid, so we can't just gradually distort along the mid-ocean ridge. It breaks like an eggshell, and it breaks along these fractures that we call transform faults. Deep sea trenches have been known since at least the 1870s and were discovered that we know of by the Challenger Expedition. The Challenger Expedition, if you remember back, actually used enough sounding rope to reach the bottom of the Marianas Trench in the Pacific, seven and a half miles below sea level. Pretty amazing. So trenches were known and in the 1960s, the first scientific study and measurements, geophysical measurements of the trenches occurred. And in the 1960s, Vinny Mines found gravity anomalies over oceanic trenches. And he studied the trench in the Southern Caribbean, Southeastern Caribbean, where the Caribbean plate intersects the, the Atlantic plate. Nobody knew what the origin of this deep zone was in the ocean. One of the techniques he was using was to measure the gravity. And so he was measuring the gravitational attraction of the Earth, and gravity meters by that time were getting sensitive enough that you could see small differences in the gravitational attraction of, of the Earth itself. As you know, gravity is only a theory, but about 300 years ago, Isaac Newton measured gravity, the force of gravity, and he determined that the force of gravity was dependent on the masses involved and their distance. But it's not just any relationship in terms of distance. The force of gravity drops off dramatically as the distance between two objects increases. In fact, it's the distance squared. So the equation for the force of gravity is mass of one object times the mass of the second object divided by the distance squared. And then that is multiplied by a constant, a gravitational constant for the Earth. Big G. And the units are in meters per second squared. And today, gravity can be measured very accurately, and it can actually be measured by satellite, and also by flying gravity meters in planes. Gravity maps, like this one of Wisconsin, show the relative high grav gravitational attractions and, and low areas of low gravitational attraction. The highs here are shown in magenta and red, and you see a dramatic high gravity zone in northern Wisconsin into Lake Superior, Superior into Lake Superior. That is the Mid-Continent Rift. So this area with high gravitational attraction that says that high density material is close to the surface of the Earth. And in this case, that's basalt and gabbro from an ancient rift system that basically runs right through Lake Superior and right down into Minnesota and beyond. That rift system dates to about 900 to 700 million years ago, almost a billion years ago. And we don't know why it stopped, but it's it was a rift similar to the East African rift, maybe reached the point of being almost like the Red Sea before it stopped. This big bullseye pattern in the center of Wisconsin, centered with blue and circled by green, low gravity 
areas. That says that there are a thick package of relatively low density rocks near the surface. And so this is Precambrian granitic rocks and metamorphic rocks, as well as a thick package of sedimentary rocks. This also suggests that the heavy material of the mantle is depressed in that area, and so you have a gravity low. Here's a little bit more high resolution map of Wisconsin that shows more granular detail. The continental crust material is in blues and greens, and the mantle material is in reds and magentas. And then the intermediate material suggests areas that the mantle is closer to the surface and the crust is a little bit thinner. So you're seeing variation on the boundary between the crust and the mantle. So high density rocks and lower density. And we have gravity maps of the whole United States. And this term, Bouguet gravity anomaly map, that's a calculation done to the gravitational attraction that strips out or subtracts out the topographic differences. So you're looking at just the gravitational attraction. And this map shows very interestingly Lake Superior and then the mid-continent rift coming down and kind, kind of dying out here in the Midwest. So there's that mid-continent rift. It wraps into Lake Superior and continues this to the east a little bit. But that's the area that almost split up North America about 900 million years ago. I was walking along the lakeshore this morning uh, along Lake Winnebago, you know, here in Oshkosh. And Sophie, my dog, and I walk along there quite a bit. And it was a beautiful day. We saw some really cool merganser ducks right there in the water. And I was going to take some pictures, so I walked over to the lakeshore. And you notice they, they line the lakeshore with these uh, big boulders from glacial debris. So this, this is glacial till that was pushed down from Canada and during the last ice age, during the Wisconsin stage. And lo and behold, you know, I'm looking, and here's this, this dark rock sitting there looking guilty. And I'm thinking, where, where did this black gabbro come from? You can see it. Uh, it's got, starting to look a little rusty. But I'm just thinking, you know, where did this thing come from? And it's a mafic rock. So its original source is from the upper mantle. I just got thinking about it. You know, this was came down from that mid-continent rift. So this is from the rift. This is probably a piece drug down by the glacial ice from Lake Superior, which is part of that mid-continent rift that we were just looking at on the gravity map. Now, there's a really good chance that this rock came from across the border. And it's just proof that we need a border wall on the northern border, border too. I think Donald Trump will get on that right away. But let's look at it just a little bit closer. And if we zoom in, you can see the rustiness. So the pyroxene that has iron in it is breaking down and rust is forming on the surface, iron oxide. But you can see the chunky light gray kind of whitish grains. That's plagioclase feldspar. It's a little bit chalky looking because it's altering to clay. There's all kinds of fractures all around from expansion and weathering. But this was a boulder brought down from Lake Superior. It doesn't belong in this area geologically, and we call that a erratic, a glacial erratic. So I was walking a little bit further, and I noticed this series of rocks, all kind of glacial debris, some of them erratics. There's limestone from the Ordovician with little lines all over it. That's made by organisms, bioturbation, made by organisms on the seafloor 450 million years ago. And then there's another piece of this black gabbro from the mid-continent rift, once again, from Lake Superior. And then there's even a piece of red granite. So here's a piece of granite. Don't take it for granite. It's from this area, so it's really not a glacial erratic, but that's the composition of the continental crust. Potassium feldspar, quartz, maybe some sodium-rich plagioclase in this case. 
And you see these, these thick areas of continental material in certain places. We call, in some cases, those are sedimentary basins. And then the intervening material between them that has high density and uh, has a high anomaly, those are where there's more dense rocks and possibly in cases where the mantle is a little bit closer to the surface. Now with satellite measurements, we can measure the same anomalies, the gravity of the Earth, on a global scale. Now you can see the effect of ocean crust, which is relatively thin, but it also has a relatively high density. But ocean crust is generally thin, generally less than 10 kilometers thick, whereas continental crust, all these blues, gravi gravitometric lows, are thick continental crust. So you see all the detail that was in the previous map for the United States is now largely gone because we've had a scale change here of anomalies. These are big anomalies between zero and 500 milligals and minus 700 for the continents. So we've changed the scale and so we've wiped out some of the little tiny details that we're seeing in those more detailed maps. But what this shows is the relatively thin ocean crust sitting over dense mantle. So the ocean crust is typically 10 kilometers in some places, especially the mid-ocean ridges, it's, it's a little bit thinner. But you see it's a little bit less dense. It's green in this case instead of reds and yellows because it's hot and uplifted. So the density drops as you heat something up. So this is relatively warm basaltic rock. In some cases, it's actually lava in little locations that would never show up on this, this global scale. But it's lower density because it's warmer. And as you heat something up, it expands, and therefore its density drops. When we back out and look at the Earth again at kind of large scale, we can see the most important place in the world is right up here, Oshkosh, Wisconsin highlighted with a yellow marker. But the, there are some other places in the world that are reasonably important too. And it's these deep sea trenches that we've been focusing on. Minez, back in the 1960s, was using a submarine and cruising over this particular deep sea trench east of the Caribbean and taking measurements, including gravity measurements, in the submarine and he noticed that over this hole, this canyon, this trench, there's the largest negative gravity anomaly in the ocean basins, known at the time anyway. It's a, it's a little bit like mass is missing from the Earth. And the surface of the Earth seems to be deformed. And it's like the gravity field, the mass field of the Earth is distorted there. And it's distorted downward. We know now... They didn't know at the time why, but we know now that the plates are coming together and they're forced down and physically down. And so that amount of mass is actually essentially missing from where it should be near the surface of the earth. It's pushed and depressed downward. This is an interesting geologic setting and a very dangerous one, actually. This Southern Caribbean region is really quite uh, tectonically active. So this Caribbean plate, this little, somewhat little sliver of, of a plate has been pushed through into the Atlantic Ocean Basin. And this, this area in the eastern part of the Caribbean plate is where ocean crust of the Caribbean plate has been forced under ocean crust of the Atlantic Ocean Basin plate. And that has resulted in, like you would expect, um, island arc settings here. So there's volcanic islands in this part of the Southern Caribbean. Big volcanoes, basaltic volcanoes and other compositions, explosive volcanoes from this um, intersection of the two plates coming together. Just like you would see like in Japan on the other side of the earth. This is very tectonically active along this transform boundary here where these plates are sliding past each other. Uh, Hispaniola, this island, this big island system. And then there's Puerto Rico and Haiti. Very tectonically active areas.
So you wouldn't think that the Caribbean would be a tectonically active area, but it actually is because of this. And the Caribbean plate is a weird tectonic plate and a weird setting that's quite complex. And geologists are still studying it, trying to figure that out uh, even today. Through these studies, Minez discovered that the largest gravity anomaly in the ocean basins occurred over that trench. He didn't know what to do with it. He didn't know what that meant. It was another one of these discoveries that's a piece of the puzzle that becomes plate tectonics, basically, the plate, te plate tectonic theory. So we've been exploring all these bits and pieces that, when put together, become plate tectonic theory. It's the development of a scientific theory. So the plates are well defined uh, around the earth and so if we're going to start with plate tectonics one of the first things I want you to think about is if you're going to explain this to somebody I mean somebody like your grandparents even they say well I've heard of this thing called plate tectonics what is it? Uh, what I want you to be able to say right off the bat is number one the earth's surface solid surface is broken up into large plates these plates move. They move on a partially molten upper mantle inside the earth, a layer inside the earth. Now, that has implications. So we have divergent plate boundaries that are the mid-ocean ridges. That's where new ocean crust is formed. So we've been seeing that. But then it, the other side of the coin is that ocean crust has to be recycled some way or the earth, and people actually thought this for a while, that the earth must be getting larger because it's obvious now that new ocean crust is forming at the mid-ocean ridges and it gets older as you move away, so the earth must be getting bigger. Well, it turns out these trenches um, are areas where the ocean crust is recycled. We say it's subducted. It's forced back into the mantle where it's remelted and recycled. And these areas, black lines with triangles on them, are areas that we now call subduction zones with their convergent plate boundaries where ocean crust is diving back down into the, the asthenosphere, the upper mantle. And the triangles always point in the direction that is diving into the, into the earth again. So you see here we were with Minez's discovery of the gravity anomaly in this Caribbean trench but there are trenches all around the earth and the biggest one is right over here east of the Philippines It's called the Marianas Trench because there's even it's seven and a half miles deep I mean come on seven and a half miles that's more you could put you could put Mount Everest down in it and have what plenty of space over the top it would be well underwater no problem so it's quite deep. It's, it's an area that's intensely depressed down back inside the earth. So you have big negative gravity anomalies at all these trenches. So the, the picture we have today of trenches is this one where, and this is a, a cartoon diagram that shows one of the missions of the Chikyu drill ship uh, from Japan. It's the new modern exploration drill ship that we, that we talked about. Remember, the distinction is it can go much deeper inside the earth because it has a pressurized riser, a pressurized drill bit. And so it, if it runs into pockets and porous areas with very, very high pressure, whether it either comes from methane hydrates or high water pressure, more likely, it can't blow out. So it's much, much safer and they can go much, much deeper. And one of the goals of the Chikyu, the reason it was built, was the goal of drilling into the upper mantle. Drilling through subduction zones like this, and then drilling the boundary between ocean crust and the upper solid mantle. Not the asthenosphere, but the upper solid part. The lithosphere is underplated with frozen, solidified asthenosphere on the bottom. Okay, but that, there's mantle there, and that discontinuity is called the moho. And so they're trying to dip, drill into that. And we talked about why Japan would be so interested in drilling into subduction zones and understanding those, because they sit just to the west of some major subduction zones. In fact, subduction zone like this 
generated the tsunami that did all the damage in 2011. And, you know, we normally know about it from the Fukushima atomic reactor disaster, which was a mess. But it, there's just a few people that were killed in that disaster. The tsunami killed tens of thousands of people. So it was much, much larger. That's what they're really worried about. And that's what Japan wants to understand and why they spend billions of dollars on this amazing drill ship to study these type of systems. So in these systems, the last bit of evidence that was recognized back in the 1960s was the depths, the focus of earthquakes. So the epicenter is the surface. Epi means surface. Center is the center, of course. But the surface, epicenter, is where the earthquake waves reach the surface of the Earth. They're generated at the focus, and that's at depth. It, it's been recognized for a very long time that earthquakes become deeper and deeper near ocean trenches. The depth to the focus at the trenches is very interesting. They dive deeper and deeper into the Earth's surface. And if you take this as South America with the Andes volca volcanoes, and the, and the Andes are volcanoes related to subduction, if we take this as the South America example, uh, earthquake focuses or foci go deeper and deeper under the continent. We didn't know what that meant. The people that first recognized this had no idea what it meant. But a geologist named Benioff was studying these, and, he, and this became known as a Benioff zone, where earthquake depths become deeper and deeper at and are related around these trenches. We now use this information as a way to visualize the down going, the down going oceanic crust being forced back under other crusts, whether it be continental crusts in this case or ocean crust, back down into the mantle. From that, the combination of mid-ocean ridges and upwelling in the asthenosphere and mantle, spreading at the mid-ocean ridge, diverging there, transform faults to accommodate the rate change, recycling the crust with subduction, as shown in this cartoon, and Benioff zones, the earthquakes generated along this subducting solid ocean crust all came together to create a coherent picture and now we represent that with a cartoon like this with upwelling in the mantle, divergence, spreading, subduction, and remelting volcanoes. And so this, this is how we got this, this whole picture from all of these different pieces of the puzzle. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail around the earth. Here's uh, another representation of earthquakes around the earth and you see areas, hot zones of earthquakes uh, like in Italy and southeastern Europe all along the, the Himalayas and then all these convergent plate boundaries are just are intensely marked by earthquakes. And of course the Mid-Ocean Ridges, a much narrow zone of earthquakes, essentially all occurring in the axial valleys. And so the Mid-Ocean Ridges are nicely drawn and defined by earthquake activity. Convergent boundaries, uh, they're a little messy. For example, look at this Benioff zone in South America that we were just talking about. Earth, the red earthquakes are relatively near the surface. This is a pretty crude um, differentiation. But the red, if you notice over here, is 0 to 70 kilometers. That's pretty deep. And then the green is 70 to 300 kilometers. And then blue is greater than 300 kilometers. And so you're seeing under South America, you're seeing that ocean crust coming from the Pacific being pushed under South America and back into the mantle. And it's going to a depth of 300 kilometers or more under South America. Now that's not true everywhere where there's subduction. Often the earthquakes will die out at 200 kilometers. What this tells you is the asthenosphere, that partially plastic, kind of partially, we say it's molten, melted, but it's more like a thick plastic, is pretty deep under South America. The continental crust is very thick 
And so the earthquakes are going deeper. And you notice, like if we go over here to Alaska, the Aleutian Islands, this is a subduction zone. There's ocean crust here, ocean crust here, and a series of arc volcanoes that are the Aleutian Islands. But there's no blue, red and green, but it doesn't get to the blue zone. So this says that the asthenosphere is much closer to the surface up here, less than 300 kilometers. And what's happening is the solid ocean crust is entering a zone where it's no longer breaking solid rock and generating earthquakes. It's kind of moving into a plastic, partially melting, and interacting that way. The actual breakage, shock wave generating breakage, no longer occurs. Very interesting, that's cool. So we see that again, here's another representation of Benioff zones. This one's focused more on the North Pacific and here you can see that relationship. There aren't any of the deep blue dots over here. So it goes red for shallow, yellow in this case for intermediate, and then blue 300 kilometers and more are non-existent here. And if you think back to the gravity maps, this is an area of intense positive gravity. The mantle is close to the surface. The ocean crust is relatively thin, 10 kilometers or so. That has a high density and it's sitting very close to the upper mantle. We can actually see that interaction right there where there's no deep seated uh, earthquake foci. Focuses? Foci. You say foci, I say focuses. I, I don't know, it's Latin. But yet then they do reappear over here. So this says that the asthenosphere is deeper over here and there's a thicker zone of solid crust and lithosphere. So pretty cool. We could look at this all over different ocean basins. Here's that South America example again. Way cool. It's We're starting to figure out how the earth works by looking at earthquakes and looking at gravity and looking at all these weird parameters, but we're kind of sorting out how the freaking planet works. I think that's pretty cool. Let's go in a little bit more detail and look at the seismic wave velocity for P waves. So this is the velocity of P waves at a Benioff zone. So this is Central America and you know this is more like the island arc system volcanoes of Central America. This would be like if you take South America, South America would be right here and the ocean crust is being subducted back under and they've colored it blue because the seismic waves, the P waves are going faster. Seismic waves are a lot like sound waves. They increase velocity with increased density and increased density can occur because the rock is cooler. Okay, so it all has similar composition but there's, there's a cooler slab of rock being forced into the asthenosphere, into the mantle, and that's that subducting ocean crust. That's really cool. So you can actually see it. You don't need the earthquake foci. You don't need the Benioff zone. You can see it in the velocity of the seismic waves. Here's Japan, volcanoes that make up uh, Japan. Here's a trench and here's the cool ocean crust being forced back into the mantle and it can be traced all the way down to the core mount mantle boundary. Wow, that's amazing. So the cool ocean crust slab is staying coherent, somewhat coherent, down to the core mount mantle boundary. That's absolutely freaking amazing. Then there's hot, more molten rock sitting up here. There's molten material over here and over here. And I don't know what's going on over here. Is that an old subduction system when the subduction was going the other way, which when you bring ocean crust and ocean crust together, nobody knows what's going to happen because it's the same thickness. It's the same density. One side could go under. This side could go under, you never know. So that's pretty cool. Finally, here are earthquakes in near Japan, under Japan and east of Japan. This is the Benioff zone. So here are earthquakes plotted, the foci of earthquakes. 
and here's the P wave velocity of the rock. Blue is faster, which means colder or more dense, and reds and yellows and greens are warmer and less dense. And you can actually see the correspondence between the earthquakes along that uh, downgoing slab relatively close to the surface. Once you get deeper and deeper, the earthquakes fade away because the rocks start to behave like plastic or ductily. Okay, so you can see lots of earthquakes near the surface and then they kind of gradually fade out with depth. Way cool. That is so cool. What an interesting topic. So if you want to study plate tectonics, this is one of the really cool areas of plate tectonics and that is the essentially a tomography, visualizing the interior of the earth using high resolution earthquake data. And we're starting to get lots and lots of data. Here's the Benioff zone with more detail along uh, Alaska, the Aleutians. So we've seen that again. So let's stop here. That's quite a bit of material and it's kind of a lot to take in that you can visualize the interior of the earth like that. And we put all these pieces together. So let's stop. I'm starting to feel a little bit like bubbles here. Uh, my eyes are like really tired and, but I'm pretty wide eyed and interested just like Bubbles is. He's always interested. So let's stop here. Next time we'll talk about the physical structure and the makeup of the ocean crust and how ocean basins break open and how they evolve. All right, see you then.